Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And all the time, what do we do? We bring you speakers who are telling about ways the world can be a little bit better, maybe how they're making it a little bit better, things you need to know to make the world a little better. That's just who we are as Rotarians. Rotary International, 1.4 million people, Rotar Rotarians and Rotaractors and 36,000 or so clubs around the world. And uh, and ours is not only an online club, it is asynchronous. So ours is, is a particularly good one for people who have a heart for service, but may find that, say, cordoning off a, a lunch every, every week on a particular day is a tough one. Our speaker this week is in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, Mike is, is a guy I reconnected with last year at a wedding because he and I attended Magnolia High School in Columbia County, uh, Southern Arkansas, go Panthers, and, uh, and played tennis together as well. And so, so all, all, all fun to have, have a friend uh, jump in as, as part of this. But as we got to talking last year, he was telling me about the work he does as a recruiter and the interesting things that have happened in the job market. And I said, you know, might you be interested in talking to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley? And he said, oh, well, let's talk. And so now you know how we got him and what he does. And I will leave more details on that front to him. Although, if you are watching this recording on our YouTube channel, you can pause, scroll down a bit, and you will see the intro. If you are watching this on the Rotary uh, E-Club of Silicon Valley page, you can pause and go back over up a little bit and, and read the intro that you didn't read before. Hang in there. Uh, so with that, let's hand it over to Mike. Mike, thank you for joining us to, to share some ideas and welcome to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Well, thank you, Russia. I appreciate it. It was good to connect after uh, all these years and uh, happy to be here. And I really appreciate it. I'd like to talk a little bit about hiring and, and the job market and some things that have, have gone on. Um, I've been in recruiting for over 21 years. And so I've seen plenty of changes uh, throughout the years and uh, both on the company and the employee side. And the job market numbers, you probably hear about them all the time, can be super confusing. Um, it seems like, and I'm not talking about just the unemployment rate, but one of the things that we hear about is, hey, there aren't enough candidates to fill these positions. And then a few months later, we find out you know, we, we don't have enough positions for, uh, you know, the candidates, vice versa. It's just always kind of up in the air there. It can be a little bit confusing. And so, um, you know, what I want to kind of mention today and go through is a little bit that this can, can happen in both ways. There can be these situations that they do and can occur at the same time as far as not having enough jobs as well as not having enough candidates for those jobs. Oh, and so I thought that was something that we could talk about a little bit today and something I get questions on um, quite a bit. I'm the person that's kind of the go-between between candidates and companies. So I deal with both sides of it. And so it gives me a unique perspective on kind of what that wish list is from both parties in there. And I've been able over the years to see those changes on both sides and have noticed quite a bit of a, of a disconnect uh, here over the last few years, which is kind of what I wanted to, to focus on a little bit today. Usually when um, people are looking for a position, there are certain main ways that they go about it. Really, we consider five main ways. And I want to talk about really kind of where I fit into this uh, more than anything, I guess, right now. Um, most people, when they're looking for a job, are going to use one of these five ways. And I start off with an advertisement. Now, right now, we'll look at uh, we're looking at all digital. Years ago, some of you may remember these were in the newspaper. Uh, that's basically what we're doing now is taking that over to the digital side. Uh, it's all done that way. Digitally, we can get more information about the company. We can get uh, we can apply right there. We can go deeper into understanding a little bit more about maybe the culture even of the company, some of the history. Super helpful to have that. Another way is people go to a company website. If you are out there and you think, hey, that's a cool company, you know, or a friend works at a company, you go directly to their website, their career section, and uh, you can apply right there. Unless you're self-employed, one of these five ways is probably going to hit you at some point uh, during your career. I want to, sorry, back up just a second. I want to talk about job fairs just a minute. Job fairs are something that we are seeing more of. They're usually associated with colleges and universities. And really, really 
helpful for those that are graduating seniors. Um, but now we have those on a national level, can be on a local level, can be virtual. So there are a lot of different options there as far as a job fair. And I think it's something that people really want to take advantage of a lot more, or we're seeing them take advantage of uh, a lot more. One other thing I wanted to mention here as we get into this is that you'll hear me refer to uh, you know, company, uh, companies having candidates and applicants. And I want to explain what we consider kind of the difference in that, because you hear that word in the media quite a bit too. So I just want to explain the difference there. And an applicant is someone that we consider that would apply for a job. Could be any job, regardless of their background. They go to the website, do it in person, but they fill out an application and they apply to that job. A candidate is someone that we would consider that's kind of maybe shortlisted. They've got the general requirements already for the job. More than likely, they would be pushed through and get an interview but we would consider a candidate someone that really has a good chance of getting that position. So a big difference between an applicant and a candidate. Now, an applicant could turn into a candidate uh, through the process. But a quick example of this would be, let's say that a hospital puts something out there online and say like an emergency medical technician. I can easily go and apply for that position. I would be an applicant for the role. I have none of the skills required, so they would really never carry me forward as a candidate in the process. So I would be considered truly an applicant. And the reason that I bring this up is because you hear a lot of companies say, oh, we had 500 applicants for this role, 300 applicants. Really, they, they, they're talking about, they're talk, they say candidates, they really have applicants. The number of candidates in that pool could be as little as five or 10 out of a group of hundreds of applicants. So it's important, I think, to to know the difference between the two. So going back into uh, other ways that people are finding jobs, networking and referrals, huge uh, part of the job process. You've probably heard it's not uh, what you know, it's who you know. And this really comes into play in the networking and referrals. So what we're talking about is someone that can point you in the right direction. Someone in your network or a friend's network that can suggest different directions that you can go as far as becoming a possible candidate for a position on there. These could be former coworkers, friends, former employers, anybody that can get you going and give you some, uh, some information to help you through the job market uh, search process. And then we come to recruiters. That's me. We have internal and external recruiters. Internal recruiters are companies that work at specific companies. They're trying to fill positions all across the board with their company, maybe in different business units, but they are employees of the company. External recruiters, they work with multiple companies. Uh, they're trying to fill multiple positions for different reasons. It could be a critical hire, could be something where it's uh, maybe they just uh, their process is taking too long, could be something uh, where maybe the uh, recruiting team doesn't have the industry knowledge. So that's kind of where I come in into play on this. And so what I do, my goal is to provide my client with candidates that they normally wouldn't find on their own. So the people that I'm working with probably aren't looking on LinkedIn. They're not looking on Indeed. These are what we consider more passive candidates. And they're not really looking to make that move. So my job is hopefully to persuade them to make that, that move and consider something, which isn't always the easiest task. I want to take just a minute to look at um, something that, that candidates really look for in a, in a new position. Now, I want you to think about this, if you could, as, as if you were a candidate, um, and what would be important to you? And I always think it's interesting to kind of get feedback in this area, because these are the areas that are really highlighted, certainly over the most recent years, but it's not the same um, for everyone. It's not the same order for everyone. First of all, candidates are looking for growth. You know, they want a place where they can advance. They want to know that there's a career path, mentorship, training, work-life balance. We're hearing that more and more. I think we've even heard it more post-COVID. You know, flexible schedules, remote work options, generous vacation time, company culture and values. This question has come up way more often than it did years ago. Candidates want to understand about the company, 
uh, as far as what they believe. They also want to understand about um, the, the, that they are aligned with their beliefs with where the company is going so that they feel a sense of support with their colleagues and the people that they're, they're working with. Job security, we all want that. It's not always possible, but that candidates are focused on companies that are giving them more long-term growth where they know that their job or hope that their job is not gonna be eliminated uh, quickly. Location, this is a tricky one especially post COVID, you know, before COVID, we would ask a candidate, are you remote? Do you want to, um, do you want to relocate? Tell me about that. Now we have so many different uh, questions that we ask as far as will they relocate? Do they only want to work from home? Will they consider going into an office? Will they consider a hybrid role? Just this question alone has changed immensely over the last two or three years. Strong leadership, Candidates want to feel like they're following a leader that is working for a common purpose. Appreciation, obviously. Everybody wants to be appreciated. Compensation, always important. I will say, though, salary is not usually the biggest motivator when people are, are making switches in jobs. Now, if someone is unemployed, obviously, being employed and getting compensation. But if you are employed and looking at other options, Salary is usually not the first thing. And the reason I bring that up, because if I'm a hiring company, these are the things that I want to think about when I'm interviewing. Those are the things that are important to potential candidates. So I need to think that way. And what we've had is what I would call transactional relationships in the employee-employer relationship over the years. And that's changed a lot. It used to just be a job description, a resume, and compensation. And you can just see on the candidate side, all the things that are important, important to candidates now. And I think if you were looking for a position, those things would probably be important to you. Those were not things that came up 10, 15 years ago in there. Let's take a quick look at, at companies. What are companies looking for? Skills and experience. That's where the job description starts. This has gotten more detailed uh, over the last few years. It's, it's used to be a little bit more on hiring for a title that we thought that everybody with a certain title kind of does the same thing. Now the job descriptions are much more complex and, uh, but this is where they, where they start. Adaptability. Companies want people that can adapt quickly in this fast paced work environment. Things are moving fast. They want people who can make those changes. Another big one post COVID. Communication, always important, but that person who can articulate their, their point, who can help resolve problems, who can work with colleagues, clients, any other st stakeholders, the way that they convey their message is huge. Company, can, companies want candidates with positive attitude, willing to take on challenges with enthusiasm. Obviously, they want people with a strong work ethic. They want people who are team players, these are people that can collaborate with the rest of the team and everybody kind of gels. You know, we do get uh, situations where we hear, man, the team is great, but we've got this one person that's just not gelling with everybody. You know, so when uh, companies are interviewing, that's what they're looking for. Leadership potential. They want to, companies want to know what you're going to do three and five years down the line. A quick side note on leadership potential. When candidates call me and they talk about the interview that they've just had, many times they'll say, hey, Mike, everything went well, but it seemed like we got off topic a little bit because the, the questions weren't necessarily pertaining to the position that I am interviewing for. And what we find out many times is companies are asking for the next job. When you get promoted, they're asking you know, the questions there. So you're technically really interviewing for two positions many times. That's how important leadership and growth is uh, to these companies. We go on to problem solving skills. Companies don't like the people that just pick out the problems. They like the people who can solve those problems. And many times companies hire because they have a specific problem. They have a pain point that they're trying to fix. They want professionalism, reliable, punctual, maintaining a high level of integrity and ethics, 
Certain industries need some creativity. They want you to think outside the box, come up with innovative new solutions. They want people within the compensation range that they have outlined there. Um, they hope to, to get as many skills as they can within that compensation range. And then, of course, location. We're, on the, the company side, we're seeing this issue as well also, where the company may have a policy uh, in the office. Another company may have uh, a hybrid situation. Another may have completely remote. Those are really different selling points for candidates, depending on where that candidate is in their life and what they're looking for. So if I'm someone looking to make a career move, this list is what I take into consideration. I want to know, am I bringing these characteristics? Am I answering these questions in the interview? Am I, the more points I hit right here where I gel with the company, the, more I, the better chance I have of having the position. So you can see with two different wish lists how many different things we've got going on now. And then they can be in different orders for different candidates and for different companies. You can see where there's some disconnect uh, on all of this. We see just the small things in, in each one of these lists can be a huge deal breaker on both sides. And when we get into Q&A, I can certainly give you a couple of examples of where we've, we've seen that. So we have this disconnect. Why? Why? We've got better job descriptions. We've got better candidates. We've got all of this information that's online. We've got, we've got social networks. We've got everything there for the information. So why are we having this disconnect? A few main reasons. Lack of visibility. Companies and candidates aren't getting to each other. Candidates don't know about the jobs. The companies don't know about the candidates. Some be, could be because of the way that they've posted jobs. It could be limited networking from both parties. It could be a lack of flexibility on location, or it could be a lack of being able to recruit, whether it's internal or whether it's in my position in you know external. There are a lot of different reasons there on the on just the visibility part. Mismatched expectations. This is kind of a catch-all area, but if you go back to the bullet points of each, work-life balance to you may mean something different to me. What's lined out in the job description may be different than what I've done in a previous job. So I may have a different idea of what that really means. Leadership, what I'm looking for and what you're providing, we could be thinking of something completely different. So really, there are a lot of different areas right here. I'll tell you one that, that, that comes up recently as a company said, we're, you know, we're looking for um, someone who, who really works hard and pays attention to detail. Well, we all think we work hard and we all think we pay attention to detail. So we have to get more information of what does that mean to the company? How will they use those skills and how do we bring that to candidates so that we know we're on the same page? Skills gap. You're seeing this in a lot of industries right now. It's just purely supply and demand. Companies are wanting more specific, detailed skills that are just in short supply. It has nothing to do with unemployment rate on these positions, it's just not matching. It's, it may be a certain software, it may be working with certain types of companies, but it is just a skills gap right there that is being a huge disconnect uh, and what is causing some of these companies and candidates to not connect with each other. And then last I'll say lack of diversity. Now this can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And uh, it, companies will, a lot of times will have a bias and look for what they consider that perfect fit. You know, they've got a, a 10 point uh, bullets on their job description and they've got one, all of those 10 and they're thinking, okay, this is what the perfect candidate looks like. They're overlooking some really great candidates by doing that. I'll tell you one quick example. If you take someone with 10 years of experience and someone with 25 years of experience, a lot of times the company gravitates towards the 10, uh, the 10 year experience simply because they feel that person is going to be with the company longer. That person can probably go with the company, grow with the company over the next 20 to 30 years. What's odd about that is people are staying in jobs at roughly four years. So there again, we have a disconnect. The company is thinking, what are we doing 10, 20, 30 years while the, the candidate is thinking, what am I doing in three to five years? 
here. So in that situation, that company is really passing up on someone with a lot more experience that could be extremely valuable to them. So as you can see with this, there are a lot of disconnects, I think, just from the candidate and uh, company side. I could give you dozens and dozens of examples. Um, and I'll tell you one real quickly that happened to us just recently. We have a, uh, a candidate that really was very specific about what they wanted in their career. They wanted to work for a certain size company, a company that's in a certain industry, a company that makes a certain product. I mean, this was really the needle in the haystack. A few weeks later, a needle in the haystack company called us and said, we're looking for this, this, and this. Needle in the haystack person, or some people in our industry would call that the purple squirrel, where there, there are few in the world that are gonna meet that criteria. It just so happens these two parties were perfect for each other. Absolutely perfect. Everything was looking great. And when it's all said and done, right at the end, the person declined to go forward, even though this was the perfect job. And the reason was that person has been home for two years due to COVID. The company had decided they are going back into the office full time. Now, neither party is right or wrong, but that one piece kept the company from finding the best talent and that talent from finding their dream job. So my point in all of this is there are so many variables now in the job market that it is just, it's just completely different. It, it's nothing like what we had before. 30 years ago, we had a job in the newspaper. It was looking for salesperson. We had a resume that said salesperson. We send it in and that's it. We hope we get the job. Now, as you can see, culture, leadership, all of these questions are so important that it's just completely changed the dynamics uh, of the whole hiring process. So just to encourage you as you, uh, you, know, you hear these things out in the media to realize that there's another piece to it, that it's not always just the unemployment rate, it's just the opportunities may be limited for people to go to or for, company, for comp companies are limited in getting talent because they're just not finding the people with the skill set they need. Or the maybe the perfect company, but maybe they're requiring this person to be in a certain location, or it's not remote, or it's in office. So a lot of different factors. And as Russian and I, I talked about uh, back in the fall, this is not your father's job market uh, anymore. And so the candidates that are most prepared in understanding the needs of the company and the companies that are most prepared in understanding the needs of the candidate, aside from the skill set and aside from just the money, those are the companies and candidates that are being the most successful in the connecting with the matches on there. Would certainly be happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, Mike. Thank you very much. Let's uh, let's stop sharing and we'll bring the group up. I'd like to introduce the people that we've got on the recording today. Uh, that includes. Let's see, quite quite a set of our members uh, spread geographically and, and happy, happy for that. When I call your name, if your camera's on, then wave at the camera if you would. Here in the Bay Area, our paella master, Shags. All right, way to go, Shags. Uh, our treasurer in Italy, Cecilia. Uh, also here in the Bay Area is Sandy. Sandy, all right. Our president-elect in Vancouver, Nick. And in Cologne, Germany, Jens, uh, good to have the group here. My name is Rushton. I am the program's chair uh, and, and excited for us to jump into some questions on this. So several questions have come through the chat, uh, one of which has to do with, uh, with, with digital nomads, right? So you, know, you, you were talking about how people's attitudes towards being in particular places, doing remote work, things like that. Have you have you begun or I, let's put it this way? Have you expanded the the draw for the companies that you work with geographically? Do you find that you're getting more candidates from farther and farther away than you would have before? And if so, what what has that brought to your work with regard to matching candidates and and companies? Well, I, I can't necessarily say that it's it's broadened um, the spectrum of candidates, but 
what it has brought into play is a company gives you a job description. They have all of the wish list that they want. And are they going to entertain candidates that may be remote? Hmm. You know, and that's something that we just didn't ask years ago. And so they have the option now uh, if they want that person, you know, say going into the office and in their in their location, are they willing to give up some of the wish lists because the perfect candidate may be completely across the country or in another country that's hitting all the bullet points. So it's it's really changed the dynamic there. And I've had um, I, I had that happen, you know, recently where we've had a candidate that it's a great candidate, great fit, and they just they're not willing to relocate but they're hitting all the hot buttons. So it's, uh, I'd say that that issue comes up uh, quite a bit. And I would also say that the companies that are being more flexible are able to get better talent or have more options than they had before. That makes a lot of sense. Nick, I believe you have a question. Yeah. And you, you actually tied into it with, with, I have a, a number of questions, but I, I will actually defer to many others if they have questions as well. But, um, how when you're talking to them about that perfect candidate um i i personally have switched to be fully remote uh, specifically mm -hmm. to give that myself that flexibility um do you find that there's because we're actually seeing a shift back obviously as well uh, um where do you where do you land is is it like in that purple squirrel situation do you do you do you do you guys go do you say guys you're you're passing up on that match like you're never going right. to find this match like how how do you convince them or do you convince them <laughs> Well, we try and we show them that, hey, this is what you could have if you have some flexibility, you know, that here's what you asked for. We can provide that, but we have to flex both ways. You know, the candidate has to be a little bit more flexible and the company has to be, will be, be a little bit more flexible. Also think it, you look at how critical is this role? You know, how important is this role to the whole company? And then what are the reasons that this person needs to be in the office? And there may be some very valid reasons uh, for that, but Many times we'll find out, well, they just need to be there, you know, or they may need to be what we call, call a hybrid where they're home two days and they're in three or vice versa. So um, it, it can vary there. But what we do try to work with the companies now much more on, hey, this this could be an option. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, too, is that um, you always have to think of competition. If you're a candidate, there are dozens and dozens of people that want the same job you're going after. If you're a good candidate, companies have to know that there are dozens of companies that are going after you. And so you always have to think of that in mind. So if a company says, we want this person here, then if that person has an equal number of skill sets, they're probably going to get the, per get the local person. It makes sense. So what you want to do is show, I can provide all of it. I'm hitting all the hot buttons. I'm more than what you're going to get with the local person. But yeah, we do. We do try to show that with our client companies um, because it's, it is a changing market and there's not a day goes by that someone doesn't ask, hey, what are the remote options here? All right. A question came in from uh, from Sandy about retirement and health insurance. How, how important is that to the candidates that you see? Oddly enough, it's rare. Um, now, yeah, I would say on the retirement part of it. Now, it is part that we negotiate um, in there. But as far as health insurance, I'd say that changed just a few years ago. It was kind of interesting because it was just standard uh, health and benefits. It was kind of the standard with everybody. You never really got into that question. And now because that has changed from company to company, uh, good candidates are asking those questions because it can be a big change in compensation. There. Now, when you're talking to retirement, maybe a company contributes to the 401k. These are all things that, that candidates look at and you know, evaluate whether they're going to make that, that next move. Uh, had someone recently that um, they were going to have to go through COBRA and it was going to be 90 days before they could switch over. It's going to be a real pain for them to switch insurance companies. And they were concerned that when they switched employers, that they wouldn't have doctors in their network. And so it, it does come up. Uh, as a question. Now, we push that over on to human resources because they're going to be more in, in touch and understand, you know, for each company. But uh, I would say overall, the questions about retirement don't come up as much. Health insurance does. Uh, but the things that I listed there, all of that, those in the bullet points would usually, you know, I'd say almost always, go ahead of uh, health and retirement. They want to make sure they're getting the other bullet points taken care of, and then that's added on. 
So I, I do a lot of work with schools, uh, school leaders, teachers, and, and find that very few schools do a very good job of telling their stories, right? As, as you talked about company culture and values, do, do you find that you end up coaching a lot of these companies on, hey, you know, you've, you've got a story to tell that isn't obvious to a lot of the people that you might be trying to reach? Yes, uh, I can't say that I coach them. I highly recommend that they uh, do it because when someone goes for an interview, that's really, that's a time for marketing and companies really it would be in their best interest if they think of that so that say 10 people are interviewing, nine of them aren't going to get the job, but those nine people need to leave thinking that company is great and they had a great experience because guess what happens if they don't? They're going to tell all of their friends and pretty soon there's word on the street that maybe that company's not the best to work for. And, you know, bad news spreads pretty quickly. We've seen that. Um, we've seen that happen. So what it's really marketing, you know, uh, being able to talk about their company, their culture and all those things. But many times, same as on with a candidate too. a candidate, uh, I can look at their resume and then we get on the phone and you just go, wow, that is a great story. That is awesome experience. Why don't you have any of that on your resume? And as people get talking, you know, they, they start you know, feeling a little bit more comfortable. C companies are the same way. You know, it's just getting that out there and having that conversation. And that's where I feel like over the years, we've had these disconnects. It's become very transactional and we're just trying to hit these bullet points, but we don't know that they all agree. So, you know, I do try to work with companies to market and tell their story, but also candidates too. You know, they've got good stories. They've got good experience. You want to talk about it. Um, I, I have a, I have a follow-on question kind of tying to all of this, which, which is um, really it's about the compensation side because it's one of those things, right? Like obviously if the compensation isn't there regardless, you, mm -hmm. someone's not going to jump. But obviously, like you said, it's not the primary reason necessarily. Um, do you, especially with the new, like a lot of the new laws around pay transparency, do, there, there's two sides of it. Do you approach discussing compensations in like the first go with a candidate? And then also on the flip side, do you help adjust the company's expectations on what is realistic based on what you're getting told in the market? That is a great question. And it comes up every single time on the candidate side and the company side. Uh, it's not the most important, but it is important. I believe there are, I think there are 21 states now where I cannot ask, uh, and, a, and a company cannot ask, what is your current compensation? So we will ask, what are your compensation expectations? So we always word it that way, but it has changed everything. I think there are, I believe, seven states now where they are required to uh, post the job uh, ranges, the salary ranges. I don't know if you've run across that. It's kind of a little bit of a cat and mouse because I've seen a couple of places that posted, you know, between a dollar and a million dollars, you know, to try to get around it and that sort of thing. Um, and then on, you know, compensation on the expectations that can get a little bit tough because you want to know what it's worth. You know, what value do you bring? You know, how do you compare to other candidates? What is the value of the job? So it's a little bit of a, uh, of a game to some degree on there, but you want to do your research, know what your value is uh, going in. Uh, and then also you want to know what the value of that position is. What would, what does the market pay for that, that role? And I've had it both ways where I've told companies, look, you're way low. You're not going to get what you're looking for. And I've told them also, you're too high. You know, you're you're paying way over market value for what other companies are. So we do try to adjust there. And then also with candidates, um, I'll tell you something briefly. Uh, a quick story on it is that if, if someone has two people have the same title, they have a tendency to think they're going to make the same money. While one may have two years of experience and the other may have 10. And the person making two doesn't never takes that into consideration. They say, well, my buddy. He, you know, we're, you know, he's making this, you know, at another company that may mean, mean something completely different. So you kind of have to take all of that into consideration, years of experience, job title, all of it. Last question before we wind things down. Um, thinking about teens, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, we have family members who are, who are youthful uh, or that we work with uh, students or something like that. What are, what are some of the things you would tell young people uh, about how they, how they should think about uh, preparing for the job market in another 
four, six, eight years? Wow, that's another great question because it's constantly evolving. I will tell you, um, definitely, <laughs> we have to say listen in school, but I can I can tell you the the things that that I was doing in college, I think they're probably doing it in seventh grade now. But you know, they, they, these candidates are savvy. They're competitive. They know it. You know, so coming out of school and we work with some of those students, they're asking great questions. But again, it's going deep, learning as much as you can, expanding your skill set, learning even when it's not required. You know, I had a situation where someone uh, told me recently, they said, man, I wish I had studied. I, I took some of those Excel courses uh, because everybody in the group is really strong in Excel. And I'm kind of, you know, just so, so take advantage of that. Um, work on your communication skills. Have your um, elevator speech. Be able to walk up to someone confidently and in a minute, tell them a little bit about you. People want people on their team um, you know, that they like and get, and get along with. And this is a, a really silly analogy that I'll, I'll leave you with. And I don't know how, how many of you know Tim Tebow, uh, the football player. So Tim Tebow, I don't know if he's, if he's going to play, play tight end, quarterback, even baseball, or if he's going to be on uh, announcing on television. But what I do know is I want him on my team. So when these kids go out there and they're going for a job, they've got to come across as, hey, we may not know where you're going to fit, but we want you on the team. We like your attitude. We like you're a team player, your willingness to learn. And so I always say, try to be that Tebow, you know, because they may not, you may go interview for one position, and come out with something completely different. You know, it just gives you an opportunity to, to show off, really. And I'll, I'll tell you, the, the thing with, um, over the last couple of years with COVID, the people that were really good at communication, maybe have a little bit of a sales personality, it really hurts them because they like to be with people, in front of people, and really engage. And now that we've got a little bit more transactional, more online, it, it can make it a little challenging for those people. So for kids coming out, I would really focus on expanding the skill set and especially the, uh, uh, the communication skills. Fantastic, Mike. I'll wind things down and then I'll hand it back to you for a final word. All of you who have joined us, thank you very much. Uh, if you are watching this as a visiting Rotarian and you would like an email to pass along to your club secretary to make up a mess, just fill out our attendant form. We'd like you to do it anyway, just so we have a sense of who, who, who out there is kind of learning about us and, and interested in finding out more about the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, which you can find, by the way, at rotary.cool. Uh, additionally, at the bottom of our of our, uh, our web page for our meeting, you'll see our Discuss Forum, D-I-S-Q-U-S, and you can leave thoughts on this presentation. You can leave thoughts on other elements of the meeting, and uh, you can respond to what comments might be there from others. We would love for you to do that. In an asynchronous club, it helps us uh, to engage with each other that way. As we always like to do, we hand it back to our speaker for the final word. So, Mike, what would you like people to have in mind as they finish watching this video? Well, I certainly appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak here. And as the job market changes so often, everything that I said today in six months will be completely rearranged and in different orders. So uh, just take it for what it's worth. Hopefully it's helpful and I'm free to, uh, to speak to anybody that has any additional questions. Wonderful. Everyone, we will see you next week.